I received several releases from the University of Missouri, from the News Bureau, and also from uh, MU Healthcare, where they're doing research. And I read the releases, and I read about research, and a lot of it I find extremely interesting, and I try to schedule some. Sometimes time just doesn't allow it, but I still find the research that's being done at MU through the various departments and and colleges and, and the hospital there something that uh, I'm amazed at because I'm not a researcher and I couldn't pass up this one because the headline that came on the release yesterday, researcher receives $5 million NASA grant to explore origin of life on earth. And I wanted to talk to the um, person behind that. And he's a researcher at the university of Missouri school of medicine. And his name is Donald Burke Aguero. And he joins me right now. Good morning, doctor. How are you? Good morning, sir. How are you? I'm doing well also. So uh, first of all, this comes from NASA. Help me understand why it comes from NASA, this kind of um, uh, research that you're doing, the grant. Sure. Uh, Our grant is to study some some things that have to do with uh, trying to understand how life came into existence on Earth. Um, As you know, lots of NASA's missions, whether they are uh, sending probes to other worlds or pointing telescopes in various places, one of the huge questions we have these days is, is there life anywhere else in our, in our galaxy, in, in the universe in general? We know we have life here on Earth, but it really this is the only planet that we know we have life. And so understanding how life started here on Earth will really help them um, uh, search for it elsewhere. So you are looking at, and help me understand what these are, first of our ribozymes. You're looking at those. What are those? Sure, sure. Uh, ribozyme is sort of one of these words that, that has two different words smashed together. The zyme part comes from like enzyme, and so we have lots of enzymes in our cells, and we're trying to make new enzymes. But instead of using the proteins, uh, which is what most enzymes are, are made of, we're using ribonucleic acid, or RNA. Now, RNA is very similar to DNA, which most people are familiar with, and so we have ribonucleic acid enzymes or ribozymes. Here's one of the things that strikes me about this. When you're talking about what you just said and the definition of ribozyme, I find that to be that's that's small, that's microscopic. And at the same time, how you described what this how this fits in, it's so large because we're talking not only universe or you're talking about other places where life may exist and somewhere down the road and maybe these things that are extremely small can tie into the extremely big and we're talking also huge time frame because as the release said the rna world hypothesis speculates that billions of years before dinosaurs and then a change of genetic carrying molecules called rna were critically important for the events that first started life on earth you understand what I'm asking, I'm sure, because the, the minuteness of this and the overwhelming enormity of this. Oh, that's a brilliant way to phrase it. Uh, yeah, so the, your, your sense of scale just goes all over the place in this kind of a project, and it's wonderful. And it's one of the things that I really love about this field. We do sometimes think about events that happen in seconds or milliseconds or microseconds, things that are on itty-bitty tiny scales with uh, billions and trillions of individual molecules inside one little tube. But we also go to the vast, enormous uh, scales as well. Mm. When you say billions of dinosaurs, think about this. Dinosaurs disappeared 65 million years ago. Um, in the, but, uh, but the Earth has been around for about four and a half billion years. And so if, uh, for most of that time, there has been life on Earth, but only the last um, 10 or 20 percent of it has it been big enough life to leave, to leave the kind of fossils we would recognize. Most of the time, the life has been microbes. Wow. And then when you, when you break that down even further, then our human life would be just a very small fraction of what you just described as big life on Earth. A tiny sliver. Uh, A lot of times people will um, map the entire history of the Earth onto one calendar year and say, well, this, uh, you know, uh, the Earth formed January 1st, and, uh, and, and, and right now we're on December 31st. When did the dinosaurs appear? When did they go away? When did we, and, and so on that kind of a map, dinosaurs appeared in November, disappeared in December, uh, and all of the rest of the, of the calendar year was pre-dinosaurs. And humans first appeared at 1158 and a half on, on New Year's Eve, just a minute and a half left in the entire year it, it, on the scale of things. 
So when you talk about the origins of life being somewhere back around January or February, I mean, that's a long time ago. <laughs> that's a lot of billions of years ago. It is. I understand that. And many of us are hoping that we can extend that time of humanity a little bit longer into that uh, New Year's Eve. Donald Burke Aguero is my guest. Again, he's a researcher. University of Missouri received $5 million grant studying molecular structures possibly linked to the origin of life on Earth. How will you know if you can make that connection? What will be the discovery that you would say, yes, I've made another step towards understanding the origin of life? That's a brilliant question. So um, um, in short, we can never actually know that we have that we have addressed how life began. Mm-hmm. What people do is they, they speculate, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, but based on those speculations, you can make predictions. And the more scientifically grounded those predictions uh, seem, then the more enthusiasm there is for testing them. And testing, uh, 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 one of the predictions is that there should exist RNA molecules that can do certain things that would keep cells alive. And um, we've gotten partway down the path of answering that question. And so far, each time we've asked RNA molecules to do the things that keep cells alive, we've been able to uh, to demonstrate, yes, they can do that. Hmm. But they're still not good enough. Um, I sometimes use the example of, of if you have a basketball goal that is three feet off the ground and five feet wide, most of us can make that shot. <laughs> uh, but... In fact, a newborn infant cannot make that shot, and a bowl of soup cannot make that shot. A bowl of soup is wonderful for what it does, but it is useless for playing basketball. So we have, we have learned ways to make RNA molecules that can make a simple basket. What we'd like to do is to make the hoop a little bit smaller, raise it up a bit higher, and show that we can actually play a game and use the RNA to drive the parts, uh, uh, the functions of a cell in the same kind of ways that our marvelous cells do right now. See, here's the problem. Life is fantastic. It is wonderful. It is humbling. It is beautiful. It's got so many moving parts, and they work. It is humbling, especially to those of us who would try to to build new variations of that and new parts and engineer them to work together. Hmm. The field of synthetic biology is, is moving along very nicely, uh, but boy, is it humbling to uh, to try to to stick your fingers in there and make something brand new and have it actually work. Let me ask you, I think i got two more questions and maybe I'll be able to uh, squeeze in here. One is, uh, how much of this research is being able to see something and uh, to uh, maybe manipulate that, what you're seeing, and how much of it is to create the instruments that allow you to see what you need to see? Yeah, you know, there is a little bit of instrument development. There's a whole lot of technology development where we're using existing in, uh, uh, instruments in new and innovative ways. So, some, so it's actually a nice blend of those two things. You really put your finger on it nicely. So we're, uh, we're trying to build new parts uh, for the biology, but we're also building new technologies that will help us build those parts. And those technologies will also help uh, the field in general build parts that will be useful for biomedicine, uh, um, uh, biofuels, uh, um, agriculture, other applications as well. I think you've answered this in a way, but I'm going to ask it as my final question, and that is this research could explore the origin of life on Earth. What's it do for us in the future? In other words, what, what will it tell us about where we're going as well as where we've come from? Well, it is, it, uh, it is one piece of the puzzle for understanding how life can come into existence as a planet begins to form, and then, and then there's the planet, and it's sitting there, and what does it take for life to appear? Um, understanding our place in the universe, uh, are we alone, are we the only place where there's life, or are there millions or billions of other worlds that have life? You know, it's one thing to say, well, there's just so many stars out there, and lots of them have planets, there's got to be life someplace but in fact, no, there doesn't. If the probability of life is small enough, then there may only be us. Uh, but we don't know how life comes into existence. Uh, the data right now are pointing in the direction of there are many ways to make life. But <laughs> there's a lot we don't know about that. Wow. Well, uh, one, uh, one last thing I have to say before I, uh, before, uh, uh, I think right this morning is that this is really a team effort. Uh, MU is the lead institution, but there are actually eight institutions involved, from California to Purdue to Mississippi. Um, uh, St. Louis University has uh, part of a team in here. 
And uh, it, uh, this sort of collaboration is what makes these big projects possible. I see. I was going to ask you that. I wondered if there any place else was doing something similar to this, but you've got to answer that question. Will this be one of those times where, if we listened real closely, somewhere in the future, we would hear a really loud aha or cheer of discovery? Or is this going to be more incremental and not lead to that one moment of aha? I think there will be a whole lot of incremental things. Uh, Every once in a while, we do get a a huge splash. It's usually only um, uh, super exciting to those of us (laughs) deep into the nerddom, Uh, but uh, we definitely had one of those um, uh, uh, with our our St. Louis University team. Uh, They showed us some data that they had, and it was just phenomenal. It was wonderful. Um, But it's not the sort of thing that would make a big headline. It's like uh, RNA can make a basket with, uh, you know, now it's four feet off the ground. (laughs) (laughs) I get it. I like that. Uh, I like that illustration. Dr. Uh, Donald Burke Aguero from uh, University of Missouri School of Medicine, $5 million grant studying molecular structures and might be able to explain more where life comes from and what it's gone through in order to lead us to where we are today. Doctor, thank you very much. I appreciate your visit today. Thank you very much. This is KFRU.